Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Paul Rubin, the product manager for Embedded Management Automation. I've been watching the, the discussion stream so far, and it seems like there's a great deal of interest in talking about automation and APIs. And I think you folks probably know the same reasons that we've been hearing loudly from customers. We've seen an emergence over the past several years of a specific class of customer that we call automators. And we did extensive research uh, last year looking at this because there are very unique requirements that are beginning to flow from customers who are trying to operate at a scale that was formerly considered impossible, uh, simply because of the economics of multiplying the number of administrators that are typically required per numbers of servers. And these customers are driving a whole new set of requirements based on their goal of managing many, many more servers with fewer and fewer administrators and doing it reliably and repeatably. So what they told us last year was that they are moving very quickly away from uh, proprietary uh, vendor-focused tools, specific consoles, specific APIs for a particular vendor. They want uh, a multi-vendor capability based upon standards. They'll take advantage of specific <laughs> capabilities, value-add capabilities that you would provide, but they're dealing typically with a multi-vendor environment in their data centers as they're growing. And they're also beginning to deploy these uh, open source orchestration and management tools, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, SaltStack. That's become uh, an important lever for them, allowing them to get a lot more control over a, a diverse set of resources in their data centers. Interestingly, they've told us that they mostly want their automation to run directly on the servers rather than operating from a centralized point on the network. They tend to want to push something to the server, have it execute configuration operations or update operations directly on the server. Now that's somewhat contrasted by, uh, and this is an oddity that we think is going to be overturned particularly by what's just we've all gone through with Spectre and Meltdown, there's a, 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 distingu a, a distinguishing feature that most enterprises lack a well-defined process for keeping their server firmware up to date. Uh, we found that a bit surprising, particularly at uh, uh, those industries like financial services or healthcare, where you think, you would think that would be a greater security issue. It has not been, but we think that's going to change pretty rapidly and that's going to again drive more demand for automation. Now from a technological point of view, many of our customers have been focused on standards like IPMI, which has a, a long-standing capability of giving them a multi-vendor capability. But in this research, they told us in no uncertain terms that they've seen IPMI live past its due-by date, that they want to see it retired. generous. <clears throat> IPMI was never sufficiently standardized enough that you could use it cross-vendor. But in fact, it is, it, it, if you look at, across the industry, IPMI tool, the open source command line interface for interacting with IPMI is probably the most used common tool for automation across all of vendors today. That's unfortunate, but that's where we are at this present yeah, but moment. It's, it, it's like the days of one gigabit fiber channel where all the products met the spec, but they didn't all interoperate. Now, I've got four specific examples uh, directly from our research of how different customers who are operating at large scale or operating with a lot of iterations against uh, a set of servers are approaching this automation problem. Uh, we can start with a very large uh, worldwide uh, financial institution. They've got 100,000 servers deployed worldwide. Uh, what they are dealing with now is the diversity of approaches by the different operating groups on how those servers are configured, how the operating system is laid down, exactly what rules and regulations are being applied to all of those deployments. Their approach was to uh, take, it, take it head on with Ansible. And they're now in the process of rolling out Ansible worldwide that is going to enforce the settings uh, of the operating systems and workload. And what they've said to us is, all right, we've got it covered from the OS up. 
we need your help to go from bare metal up to the OS level. And we need you to fit into the environment that we're going to use for that automation. Now, a slightly different approach was taken by uh, a, a, a worldwide web services organization that's got 50,000 <coughs> servers deployed today. They're on a growth ramp that's going to take that to uh, 200,000 servers in the next couple of years. They opted to throw computer scientists at the problem. They started from day one saying, we know we're going to scale so quickly, we could never have enough administrators to actually cover all the servers that we want. We're going to throw computer science at this. They custom scripted all of their automation and today are managing those 50,000 servers with less than 10 administrators. So they are probably uh, the, the, the poster child for taking this approach, but they are the most extreme. Uh, obviously, most customers are not going to go hire a staff of compu PhD computer scientists to build their automation. They're looking for more off-the-shelf approaches. Now, in the uh, uh, high-speed uh, trading realm, we had another customer who has a smaller deployment. Their problem was not uh, lots and lots of servers, although 5,000 servers in a, in a hypercube is still a pretty su sufficient number of servers. Their goal was to be able to turn over the workloads on that cube uh, very rapidly. And uh, working with <coughs> us, they used our APIs to actually build their own custom scripting, again, a custom approach, where they're now do doing, doing deployments as many as 500 reprovisions of that cube per week. So this, these are the extremes that we're seeing, both in terms of the rapid <coughs> turnover of the workloads on the systems or managing many, many servers uh, using a lot of automation. And the final example is a, a, a telecom, worldwide telecom provider. In this case, uh, the, the video services part of that organization, they serve up 100 million plus hours of video uh, per a month uh, to their customers. And they were looking for ways to simplify the management that they had put in place that was all a lot of customized scripts using our command line interface. In cases of, say, a deployment of a server where they were carrying out configuration, those scripts typically would run many hundreds of lines long and became very difficult to maintain. They went off and built their own, uh, again, a custom approach, went off and built a system that allows them to now do that same deployment and configuration of the server using a five-line Python script. That's leverage that makes a big difference in getting these servers deployed. Now, I'd be interested in your input. We believe that it's a, a one-two punch is really necessary to support automation. On the one hand, uh, the driving of standards is going to be critical because the market has said to us in no uncertain terms, there has to be a baseline of manageability. Regardless of what vendor is in place, we want you guys to all adhere to a specific standard. And we've been focused on that for the entire lifetime of PowerEdge. Going back to 1997, when we introduced PowerEdge, we also introduced the capabilities for using SNMP for monitoring the servers. So that was our first foray into using standards. We've taken further steps and we've gotten very proactive, beginning with our efforts around web services management in the early 2000s where we actually led the charge in defining those standards, created the committee, drove the standards, and then drove that into the deliverables of the product itself, enabling uh, web services management through the IDRAC, those APIs built directly into that. Now those learnings have been uh, very helpful as we've fast forwarded to um, today where customers began demanding uh, more alignment with the APIs with the way they're working. The DevOps world, a RESTful API world that can utilize the same tools that they're using for web services to also manage the servers. And that gave rise to Redfish, and we're going to talk more about that in, in a few slides, but we began delivering that back in 2016. That's iterating forward and picking up uh, a lot of momentum because of demand in the marketplace. Now that one-two punch of building standards and delivering to market and also innovating around those standards <clears throat> and adding capabilities uh, is the basis on which we've been delivering automation capabilities for PowerEdge every step of the way. 
So we've now got a very robust set of capabilities in terms of APIs that are built directly into the IDRAC and are now being delivered as part of Open Manage Enterprise that Ryan's going to talk to us about uh, in a short while. So today we've got RESTful APIs that allow me to carry out all the management functions against the IDRAC to interact with an individual server. RESTful APIs at a console level that allows me to carry out one-to-many operations against all of the servers that I want to manage as well as continuing to support legacy APIs. So we're carrying forward, inherent in the IDRAC, the ability to manage that server using IPMI, using SNMP, and continuing to support WSMAN as well. Now there are customers who have a preference in certain instances for using a command line interface. And for them, we have both our own uh, Rack Atom command line interface, that command line is, which supports both the IDRAC as well as our chassis managers for our modular servers is a common, common CLI across those form factors. And we do also support the open source command line interfaces like IPMI tool that we mentioned earlier. Now we've talked uh, several times about a profile based configuration. That's another key ingredient and a value add ingredient uh, from a Dell perspective allowing you to use a single file to describe every setting inside of that server, as well as to provide a pointer to firmware that you want applied to the server as well. well. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. In addition to that, though, we know it's crucial to provide enablement. So in addition to building the APIs, we have also are providing enablement libraries. We have a whole GitHub set of GitHub libraries that support our APIs, that support Python and PowerShell uh, interfaces, where we'll provide scripts for the key use cases uh, that are of interest to our customers. We're building out those libraries as time goes on. And we also have a tremendous uh, white, uh, white paper uh, library on Dell Tech Center that describes in detail how to make use of these scripts and illustrates those use cases. So for the scripting enablement, you have specifically listed there just IDRAC. Do you also have for some of the other components for say Open Manage Enterprise and potentially maybe to some of the legacy APIs if, the, if they're extendable to some of those, uh, some of those scripting languages? Uh, uh, watch this space on Open Manage Enterprise, but uh, definitely uh, have also support for the legacy. Uh, there's a, a, a very robust uh, Python library for WSMAN, for example, that's out on GitHub today. Uh, there are also, we have uh, uh, customers who've also developed their own uh, libraries. Uh, the Dractor would be one example that I would point you to that was developed uh, uh, by a customer that allows, that also supports uh, WSMAN today. Uh, so there, yes, the legacy uh, APIs are also represented. Okay. So definitely m more to come in that space as we expand into uh, the uh, uh, operations from the Open Manage Enterprise level. If you're not familiar with Redfish, uh, you should get familiar with it. Uh, Redfish has been uh, uh, an effort that has taken off uh, far more quickly than I expected it to. I've been involved in uh, helping to develop systems management standards for uh, server management for the last 25 years. And I've never seen the industry respond the way it did to the demands from the marketplace. Redfish is a direct outgrowth of demands from uh, the most uh, uh, demanding of automation customers. Those folks came to us and to the other leaders who are providing servers into the marketplace several years ago and made it clear that they were at a breaking point. Uh, IPMI was not meeting their needs. They felt like there was a large disconnect between what the vendors were building into their servers and the way they were developing against uh, the, the web services that they were putting in place. Their demands really revolved around, you got to give us a RESTful API, it's got to be super secure, it's got to be scalable, it's got to fit to the models that we're using in DevOps today. The Distributed Management Task Force took that challenge. We co-chair the, uh, the, the uh, Scalable Platform Management Forum that is the standardized making body for Redfish. 
Now we went from a literally from a blank whiteboard to a 1.0 specification in about 18 months time. And that's that's pretty quick turnaround. And we went from <clears throat> that to delivered capabilities, 1.0 capabilities we delivered, HP delivered, Supermicro delivered, Cisco delivered, Lenovo delivered within a year of that 1.0 specification. And the demand has just continued to grow since the time that we introduced those 1.0 capabilities. The API has pretty rapidly matured and we're very, uh, very confident that today's Redfish implementations that we're shipping, that the other vendors are shipping, is a fully functional replacement for IPMI, giving you uh, a secure capability, something that's far more scalable than anything that IPMI has been capable up till now. And it gives you all the key functionality using the API. I can reboot and power control the server, fully inventory all the hardware, and firmware that's installed in the server, even carry out server firmware updates or BIOS configurations. I never thought I would live to see the day that there'd be a standardized API that would allow me to update the firmware on any vendor server that supports the standard. But that's a capability that we're and the other vendors are delivering today. Big breakthrough for customers. The True. users are very happy about that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and have only one question, why did it take so long? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rhetorical question. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, over, over several beers, I'm sure we could uh, have an interesting discussion on that point. So Redfish is here, it's live, we're delivering it today. Uh, customers are down, f fairly far down the path, the most sophisticated customers are fairly far down the path in terms of their proofs of concept. Uh, I, uh, you won't, probably won't see too many customers with live deployments as of yet, primarily because there are not a, a sufficient installed base of servers that support Redfish and Redfish 2016 in particular. But we think over the next year to 18 months, uh, we're going to see a pretty rapid adoption of Redfish, and it's going to become the primary uh, automation means across all x86 servers and even beyond that as we'll, we'll talk about in just a moment. Now when we delivered uh, iDirect 9 uh, for the 14th generation of uh, PowerEdge servers, uh, that was our, our first step forward with supporting of Redfish 2016. And that, that standard was uh, crucial in getting to these standardized BIOS configuration capabilities, standardized inventory of firmware, and update of firmware. So those capabilities are now being delivered in the 14th generation of servers. But we've not left behind our installed base. We've also been backporting uh, these Redfish capabilities for 12th and 13th generation PowerEdge servers as well. So it, it's generally a step behind what we're delivering on 14G, but we uh, intend to continue to support it and we will fully implement Redfish 2016 across uh, 12th, 13th, and 14th generation of PowerEdge servers. Now, in addition to supporting the base standards, uh, we've also uh, added value, and one of those value adds was uh, to support our profile-based configuration. In this case, to give you a capability for RESTful server configuration. So think of the power of being able to make a single API call passing a single file that describes every setting that I want applied in a server, every BIOS setting, every IDRAC setting, every RAID controller setting, network interface setting, as well as providing a pointer to a firmware repository that defines the baseline of firmware that are required to be running on that server. So that single API call is extremely powerful. It's going to make sure that that firmware matches the repository, meaning I need to downgrade as necessary or upgrade all of those components and then apply all of the settings that you've commanded for that server, all carried out using a single API call. Now that functionality is enabled not only through the RESTful API, but as we've talked about through the other interfaces as well. I can use the command line, the Rack Atom command line, to command uh, applying these uh, profiles. <coughs> Auto-config feature that we spoke about earlier also supports these same capabilities. 
and the IDRAC GUI as Doug showed us earlier today. Now this slide is uh, already out of date. It says coming soon and actually today is the day of coming soon. Today we announced availability of our integration with Ansible. So this is again in direct response to our uh, automators who are already down the path using Ansible uh, for their integration, for their deployment of operating systems and workloads. And we've now got a set of run books and script helpers uh, that they can use for doing bare metal deployments. And what does that mean? What that means is I can now integrate uh, uh, using the, the RESTful APIs that we've been talking about. I can drive those from Ansible. I can use that to, again, configure all the settings, manage the firmware that's on that server, uh, kick off an OS deployment process, and there's some <clears throat> additional capabilities in terms of backing up and restoring the settings of the servers, uh, even exporting the logs out of the server as necessary, all using Ansible. So this is uh, uh, the, the number one uh, orchestration tool that's available in the market today. This is a starting point for us. Uh, we know that there are a whole range of these orchestration tools that are in demand, Chef, Puppet, SaltStack, uh, others that are growing of interest. Uh, we're looking at all of those as uh, uh, future additions that we'll provide uh, as the market demands. Now all that focus has been on uh, using the API uh, and focusing on a single server, but we're also building uh, RESTful APIs uh, from a console perspective as well. And the Open Managed Enterprise, and Brian will tell us more about this uh, a bit later, <clears throat> Open Managed Enterprise also is providing a northbound API. So I can also write scripts using uh, RESTful API calls into Open Managed Enterprise. We're carrying out the same kind of functions that we've been talking about for a single server. I can now apply them across an entire range of servers carry out one-to-many uh, 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 functions, discover all of the servers that are under management uh, by a particular Open Managed Enterprise console, uh, get individual health status information, or use it to enforce settings and apply settings across not one servers, but across thousands of servers that are being managed uh, by that console. So this is a, a definitely a, a powerful force multiplication where I can, from a, a single point of control, carry out all of these functions, again, using RESTful APIs. An interesting aspect of what has happened with Redfish and the popularity of this approach among automators is that it is driving a whole nother set of standardization efforts. The popularity of taking this RESTful approach has led directly into using the same approach for managing other components. Uh, Swordfish is a, a, an allied standard that was developed between DMTF and SNEA. Uh, SNEA has been developing standards for shared network, <coughs> meaning uh, SAN, NAS, <coughs> object stores. They've been developing standards for many years. Jointly, we've developed the Swordfish standard which is using a, a RESTful API approach that's modeled after Redfish for also managing these shared storage devices. The uh, uh, Dell uh, Force 10 organization actually contributed a standard for network, switch, network <laughs> switch management. Again, <laughs> actually I don't know what the code name is for that. Uh, I have to look that up, but I do not believe it's Bluefish. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't believe it is. Uh, and interestingly, we, we've been approached by the vendors in uh, the uh, data center uh, infrastructure, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, security. These organizations are now working, working directly with us to also build out <coughs> their own standards, again modeled on Redfish, to allow for RESTful APIs for monitoring and management of the data center infrastructure in addition to the servers and stores that are in that environment. Importantly, we've also been working across standards organizations. Uh, the uh, Open Compute Project approached us 
on uh, aligning uh, the open compute standards, OCP standards directly with Redfish, and they've now published a, an interop, uh, interoperability standard on how to make use of Redfish in, a, in an open compute project environment. Uh, same work is going on uh, with OpenStack at the present time, and we've begun engaging with, directly with the orchestration vendors uh, to utilize uh, Redfish and these offshoot uh, models uh, to align and actually build reference implementations, uh, run books for all of these various orchestration tools that make use of the APIs. So we're very committed. We are in whole hog in terms of driving these standards, but also in terms of building out our own capabilities that can add value to those standards, go beyond what you can do just using the standards. Now there's a, a wealth of information available to you. Um, I, I, we will, I'm sure we'll be making this information directly available to you, but uh, a range of uh, white papers, uh, the uh, uh, videos even, how-to videos that are out on YouTube today, as well as, <clears throat> as well as a variety of open source tools that you can utilize to uh, Im implement your own DevOps approach to utilizing the Redfish capabilities that we're building today uh, into every PowerEdge server. Questions? If not, I thank you all very much. Uh, we have uh, uh, lots, of, many more, uh, many more interesting conversations to come. And uh, let us know if uh, you have any other questions as as pertains to automation and where Dell EMC is headed in enabling our customers to manage many, many thousands of servers uh, with the leverage of automation. Thank you.